Good afternoon. What a great crowd. This is really remarkable turnout for a July warm summer day. We, we were expecting, you know, three or four hundred of our best friends to be here, and looks like you all showed up. So <laughs> glad to have you here. And uh, my name is Doug Edgerton. I'm the president and CEO of the North Carolina Biotechnology Center, and we are proud to host this event this afternoon. I'm very pleased to see such a great turnout. North Carolina is the home to the fastest growing agricultural biotechnology cluster in the world. We'll take that claim. Uh, we believe that uh, the North Carolina leads the, the country and uh, certainly uh, its activities in this space have now been branded as the ag biosphere. And we believe that is the way for people to refer to all the work that you all do. We are pleased to have so many of the leaders and, and great thought uh, leaders and companies in this space here with us today. But today, we are more excited to have and welcome a legend in this field and world class of, of world-class professionals, Dr. Mary, Mary Dell Chelton. She's the Distinguished Science Fellow and founder of Syngenta's Biotechnology Research Labs. During her illustrious career spanning more than five or almost five decades, Dr. Chilton has led collaborative research study at Washington's University in St. Louis and produced the first transgenic uh, genetically modified plants. And that forever changed the world of, of the agricultural biotechnology field. Genetic research is now the way of the future as far as we can tell. Dr. Chilton is recognized for her groundbreaking research and continued impact on agriculture. She has a list of honors. It's really big. <laughs> so we're just going to narrow it down to a few. Uh, 2013, she won the World Food Prize, and she's the World Food Prize laureate. 2015, the National Inventors Hall of Fame inductee. 2011, the Crop Science Society of America pres uh, Presidential Award. 2002, the Ben Franklin Medal for, in Life Sciences from the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. And some of the other people that, that have been inducted into that are Alexander Graham Bell, Thomas Edison, Pierre and Marie Curie, Albert Einstein, and Stephen Hawking. Pretty good company, I'd say. We are very fortunate to have that kind of talent around here. There are but a, these are but a few of her many distinguished uh, accolades, and we are pleased to welcome her. And if you would mind giving her a warm welcome, and come up and take the stage. I, I hope you'll forgive me for reading my remarks today. I spent a long time writing these remarks, and uh, I, I assure you that uh, if I read them, I will keep the time instead of yettering on for an hour. <laughs> so you will appreciate that. OK, for, for those of us who are involved in uh, plant science and agriculture, we're in what you might call the best of times and the worst of times. These are the worst of times because hunger is already a problem in the world. And the experts foresee a 30% increase in world population by mid-century. Even worse, the carbon dioxide produced directly and indirectly by that population is causing changes in climate that will impact food production adversely, probably. And yet, if you enjoy research, as I do, if you thrive on challenge, if competitiveness, if competitiveness is your middle name, then without question, you have been born into the best of times. We have the resources, we have the will, and we have the tools to meet these challenges. And not only are we in the right time, we're in the best place. We are in North Carolina, where recruitment is easy because this is a place of good living, good schools, and good old Southern hospitality. We are neighbors to fine universities with amazing intellectual resources at Duke, at NC State, at Carolina. We are in the Research Triangle Park, a prestige address for agricultural biotechnology. If agriculture and plant sciences can be said to have a pulse, we feel it, each of us. Well, how did all of this come to pass? I don't know about each of you, but I, at least, was not born with a vision of future scientific inquiry. As a kid, 
All I wanted to do was ride horses, draw and paint horses, and read books about horses. <laughs> Dogs would do when they ran out of horse books. <laughs> the closest I came to uh, science was a dusty old library book that was entitled Astronomy with an Opera Glass. Now, some of you are too young to know what an opera glass was, but in, in olden times, people who sat in the back row of the opera had a little ornate, low-power uh, pair of binoculars that they used so that they could see the, uh, the opera performers. All right, so astronomy with an opera glass, that was my science. So I had yet to discover science, actually, and that happened when I was in high school. But we're going to skip over that. Um, when I got to uh, college, I went to the University of Illinois, and uh, I became a chemistry major at Illinois when, at a time when the uh, term molecular biology was still fairly newly coined. Watson and Crick had only recently discovered the double helical structure of DNA. We already knew that DNA was the substance of genes. Using purified DNA, it was possible to transfer a gene from one bacterium to another. We knew that. Using uh, uh, DNA from a soil bacterium called Bacillus subtilis that was resistant to the antibiotic streptomycin, for instance, that DNA could be added to a, a strep-sensitive strain of Bacillus subtilis. And you could easily, after that, find individual bacteria that had picked up some of the DNA and become resistant to strep. So individual genes were in that pool of DNA, and we could move them from one bacterium to another after purification. That proved that DNA was the genetic substance. So this process is called bacterial transformation, and it worked with astonishing efficiency. The only requirement for this procedure to uh, work the only requirement was that the DNA had to come from the same kind of bacterium. If the DNA didn't match the recipient organism, the repair process called recombination didn't work. As part of my postdoctoral work, I measured just how closely related the donor DNA had to be to the recipient bacterium. And we, we found that uh, even a 1% mismatch would have a, a terrible impact on the efficiency of the process. It went way down. So we noted that, uh, that the donor DNA in this bacterial transformation process even had the wisdom to go to the right place in the bacterial chromosome. DNA seemed to be a molecule with brains. And I was eager to figure out how this happens the first time I learned about it. Several years later, I heard about another soil bacterium Agrobacterium, a microbe that caused galls on many kinds of plants. Some scientists believe that agrobacterium transferred DNA to the plant cells with a gene that caused the gall to grow. But in my wisdom, I knew immediately that this idea must be wrong because the DNA of agrobacterium would not match plant DNA, right? No match, no transformation, shouldn't work. So I knew that the whole concept was wrong and the publications uh, that claimed that it was right had to be wrong. So working with a small group of students and postdocs and professors at the University of Washington in uh, Seattle, we did an experiment that would give us an answer either way, yes or no, clearly, whether the DNA was there or not. I'm going to skip over some twists and turns in the plot, but it turned out, to my astonishment, that agrobacterium was indeed guilty as charged. We did the experiment again and again, always with the same outcome. I was dragged to the conclusion, kicking and screaming, more or less. But in the end, there was no disputing the evidence. Agrobacterium was forcibly delivering a few genes to the cells of the host plant. This story, of course, is a testament to the power of the scientific method. When you properly construct a repeatable experiment, you get the kind of evidence that you can rely on. This lets you draw new conclusions and set aside old convictions, no matter how firmly they're held 
with confidence. When the results say you've got to change your view, you change your view. This result, while indisputable, was nevertheless difficult to publish. The referees of our manuscript didn't want to believe it either, it turns out. <laughs> but finally, in 1977, they accepted our paper. They made us do it a few more times. But finally, they accepted our paper in 1977, and we, we now know about a different kind of DNA repair called non-homologous end joining. Non-homologous end joining. So the DNA doesn't have to match. Um, so this is, what, this is the process that's used by the plant cell to repair accidental chromosomal breaks, which would be fatal to a cell otherwise. The process seems to be the mechanism that agrobacterium has adapted to smuggle its genetic package into the plant cell chromosomes. With hindsight, we now see agrobacterium as a natural genetic engineer. The genetic package that it delivers which we call tDNA, transfer of DNA, specifically causes the gall cells to divide rapidly, and tDNA also makes them produce a metabolite, a new chemical compound called an opine, octopine, nopaline, different opines, that agrobacterium can metabolize uh, readily, but its competitor bacteria in the soil cannot. So it's a genetic engineer. It's doing this purposefully. It's farming the host plant. We soon, le soon learned how to add a gene of our choice to the natural tDNA, and indeed we found Agrobacterium would transfer our gene together with its own package of uh, genes. And now uh, we, we knew how to put genes into galls. Now putting genes into galls is fine as a hobby, but it's far from being a profitable business. <laughs> we, we needed to figure out somehow how to, uh, how to disarm the tDNA so that it no longer made galls. And by 1983, by this time I had moved to Washington University in St. Louis, and in collaboration with Andrew Binns, who was at University of Pennsylvania, we managed to disarm tDNA. We did it by accident, actually. We knocked out one single gene in tDNA, and uh, we did it by adding a yeast gene in its place. Um, it was the, gene, the yeast gene for alcohol dehydrogenase. Um, this gene, alcohol dehydrogenase, is the enzyme that, um, that you use to detoxify the alcohol when you have too many martinis. Um, <laughs> but the plants weren't drinking martinis, and it was not a, not a very useful engineered trait. Um, <laughs> all right, so the, the resulting agrobacterium uh, strain that we, uh, that we had wouldn't make galls for us, and so we, we approached Andrew Binns to help us out. He was, uh, is an expert on tobacco cells, and he worked with this uh, tDNA, this agrobacterium strain, and he found that it made transgenic plant cells that could only grow if you added cytokinin. Unlike the gall cells that we expected, these transgenic cells could regenerate into plants. They still carried the tDNA and the yeast transgene that we had added. The transgenic plants produced seeds that carried our transgenes on to the next generation and the one after that, and so on. This was the first genetically engineered plant. That lucky plant got its picture on the cover of Cell. Uh, <laughs> It was, it was uh, totally useless, as I've indicated, but it did show that we could do it. In 1983, perhaps as a result of this achievement, which should have gone to Andrew Binns in truth, I was offered a job by Siba Geige, um, now two, consolidator, two consolidations later, uh, it is called Syngenta. Uh, I was hired to establish a new agricultural biotechnology unit for the company uh, in Research Triangle Park to hire the people to erect a new laboratory facility in Research Triangle Park and develop a project portfolio. I mistakenly thought I could do this job, but I did my best. It, 
I, I took the job, but it soon appeared that Siba Geige and I would have an unhappy marriage, at least for a while. They had a monocot seed business, hybrid corn seed, and I was a dicot genetic engineer, tobacco. I, I knew nothing but tobacco. Fortunately, uh, this was to be corrected. This situation was to be corrected in due course by, uh, by future progress, future research, both here and elsewhere. Monocots were found to be transformable by agrobacterium and other, in, in addition, other physical means of introducing DNA into monocots were also found. For example, the gene gun could deliver DNA coated gold particles into either cells or protoplasts. In addition to that, protoplasts could be transformed by naked DNA or by liposome encapsulated DNA. Alternatively, DNA uptake could be induce, induced by electroporation or by polyethylene glycol. It turned out that monocot protoplasts had an unfortunate tendency to lose fertility upon regeneration. That is, the plants that regenerated from protoplasts lost fertility. Um, so it wasn't, a very, uh, it wasn't a very efficient way to make fertile plants. But people did that. Um, in, in addition, um, many of these physical, these physical methods of delivering DNA um, introduced multiple scrambled broken DNA fragments whereas agrobacterium tDNA put in one or sometimes several neat single stretches of DNA. So in the end, my old friend agrobacterium tDNA has been found to be the technology of choice for most practical applications. Um, I say most, not all, because uh, there are some experiments where you would like to deliver double-stranded DNA and agrobacterium tDNA, at least initially, starts out as single-stranded DNA. But I digress. So here we are with good technology for crop improvement. It needs to be better if we're going to meet the challenges ahead. And indeed, it is improving at an astonishing rate. Uh, what an amazing time we're in to be involved in agricultural research. But don't forget the numbers. By 2050, there will be 9 billion people on this planet. That's 2 billion more than we have today. That's a mind-boggling number. Just in the next 10 years alone, it's estimated that we will add 750 million people, which is basically the population of Europe today in just the next decade. Syngenta is committed to feeding a growing population by improvements in efficiency. We call it the good growth plan. We want to rescue more farmland. We want to help biodiversity flourish and to empower small stakeholders. We cannot do it alone. This room is filled with many of the best minds in agriculture, and our combined efforts are going to be required to ensure that agricultural biotechnology keeps pace with the needs of a growing population. Growers are rapidly adopting multi -com combined trait crops for insect control, water optimization, yield improvement, oil and protein quality, and improved bioprocessing. Ultimately, these technologies help reduce chemical applications and provide simpler, more environmentally friendly farming practices such as no-till agriculture. So that's our challenge, our plan, our rationale for what we do. It will not be easy. And curiously, the most important challenge of all is to contribute to public acceptance of our technology. Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, is an important place to spread enlightenment about the value and need for our work. I am committed to that goal, and I invite you to join me in that effort. Thank you very much.